Today I'm going to show you um, Surge Map, but before that, uh, I just want to sh um, share with you a little bit of a uh, different concept. So I have two, um, two jobs. My day job is uh, I'm in charge of the research for the spine division at uh, HSS. And my night and weekend job is not too sexy, but I'm uh, in charge of uh, uh, the technical aspect and the research and development for, for Surge Map. So uh, sagittal plane, what are we talking about? A and um, we're gonna sh I'm going to show you some cases with within the software, and we're going to use those cases like as, a, as an excuse to talk about sagittal plane. So basically, uh, where, where do we have or not? We can take a full body images, so the famous AOS system, uh, and this can appear as being a very complex because you have to take into account the head, the thoracolumbar lumbar junction, the knee, the, the, the hip, but we can really simplify that, and we can simplify the analysis of the sagittal plane using three parameters. One will be the SVA that we talked about uh, previously. The second one will be the curvature of the lumbar spine, and the third one will be the orientation of the pelvis. And you can apply those principles on every single patient. And the reason why we are mainly focusing on those three parameters is because they correlate with patientreporty.com. You know, we, we don't treat an x-ray, we treat uh, the disability and the function. And those parameters seem to be correlated with, with disability and function. At the level of the cervical spine, we already talked a little bit about that. Again, you know, there is some key parameter that seems to correlate with patientreporty.com. And that's why there have been a big push in the past uh, 10 years uh, in terms of sagittal alignment. So why does it matter? It matters because it correlates with disability. There is a very high prevalence of sagittal malignment. So if you look at this patient, this patient, patient seems, seems to be like, you know, an easy, easy one. You made a mistake. But, but, but when, when you start to measure the parameter, what, what, what do we know? So this is a grade one degenerative spondy, but basically there is a 30 degree loss of lumbar dosis. So we're not talking about five, six degree, 30 degree loss of lumbar dosis. The SVA, the plumb line, fall in front of the femoral head, and there is a rotation of the pelvis. So if you go by the uh, SRS criteria of deformity, this simple degenerative patient fit all the criteria of sagittal plane deformity. So it doesn't mean that you need to jump on every single patient and start to operate on everybody that has a, a loss of lumbar dosis. Uh, it just means that when you start to measure, you're gonna see that it's very, uh, very prevalent. And if you choose to operate for clinical reason and do a fusion, then you need to measure your film. And now more and more there is some, some, some new, st new study and some of them are coming from the, from the UK that demonstrate that even in a setting of one to three level, when you fuse a patient with a, a, a malalignment and you do not correct the malalignment, then you increase the likelihood of a patient to require a, a revision surgery for adjacent segment. So uh, I know that it can appear as being a complex exercise, sometimes an academic exercise, but how do you do sagittal plane uh, uh, measurement? So with, uh, with surgery map, uh, basically, you can follow an animation. You follow the, the, the guide and you have to measure, identify the femoral head, the sacrum, L1, T1, and if you want to do the cervical spine, then you do, you do C2. And just based on that, all the parameters that uh, uh, have been described in the literature, or the most common one, are going to be displayed. And I'm going to sh show you basically uh, how to do that in, in surgery map. So really, uh, you take a few landmarks, and then you have a color code that tells you red is bad, green is good, and orange is so-so. Uh, so we did our due diligence. We did a validation of the software. And even better, other people did the validation. So we're quite confident that you, ca you can use it. What else can you do? Because that's one thing to measure the film, but, but, but uh, um, you also need to organize your film. So we have a, a, a database where you can put all your case. You can share your case. You can import from PAC system. You can import from another surgery map database. Uh, if you have a JPEG, you can also do exactly the same, the same type of measurement. Uh, you can save all your measurement on the cloud. This means that everywhere you are, if you have an access to internet, you can see your film. You can see your surgical strategy. Uh, you can also have everything on your uh, uh, iPhone. And basically, Surgery Map is also uh, helping you to apply some of the concepts because, you know, I told you that I have like two, two hats. So one of them is like a, a, a clinical research, and the second one is Surgery Map. So when we develop something from a research point of view, like in the past few years, we realized that 
Okay, there is some global guideline that has been defined in the literature that has been accepted by, by the scientific community. But more and more, we are moving toward patient-specific threshold and also taking into account the age of the patient. So what does it mean? It means that depending on the age of the patient, you're going to have different alignment target. So when you have a young adult, you're not going to try to, to have the same alignment that if you have a 70-year-old. You know, when you go on the street or if you look at your, 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 your grandparents, life is a kyphotic event. So with age, kyphosis increase, blood disease decrease, the trunk tilt forward. So when you operate on those patients, you're not going to try to put them straight, as straight as a 20-year-old. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go in, uh, into a surgery map and go parameter by parameter. Can we just go by definition? Yep. Yeah, so let me, and, and basically in the software, you, ca, you can have some age-adjusted guide. So you do the basic measurement, the software grabs the, the age from the patient from the DICOM and define, gives you a line, a guide in terms of alignment. So let me switch directly to the software so that we can see some of those parameters and wh what is the meaning. So I can close that. So um, this is this is software. So basically, there is you know like any software, uh, you first import your image. So I have some image in my um, my folder here. So you can have some some X-ray. So once you have an X-ray, you just select them, it save, and that's it. Because it's a DICOM, it's going to automatically organize everything in the database. You can retrieve your image from 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 your pack system and then find your image in your, in your database. So this is a, a pediatric case. Let's take maybe, um, let's take this patient. So I, I start from scratch. So this is an old patient, a 94 year old. If you want to do the measurement and, the, and then go over the, each measurement, there is one tool, it's called the sagittal alignment tool. On the upper left corner, when you click on it, then you just have to follow the animation of the upper left corner. So basically, I have to identify the first femoral head, the second one. Then the software is telling you to identify S1. Then L1. Then you skip to T1. If you don't have the cervical spine, you can just stop there. So the, if you have the cervical spine, you click on C2. So let me just uh, maybe show you this line bigger. OK. Then you're just going to adjust the line. So it's really. Uh, uh, Oh, what's that? Go away. So it's really, uh, uh, you, you don't need a lot of point. You just need the femoral head, the sacrum, L1, and T1. And if you want, you can keep going. So then what do you get? You get a bunch of parameters that you have no idea what, what they mean. So here we have on the left, let me just put that here so that we can all, all see the parameter. So what do we get? We get the orientation of the pelvis. If you click on each of those parameters, you're going to have a definition. So the pelvic tilt, you know, remember we start by the pelvis because that's really the foundation of the spine. The pelvic tilt is a parameter that measures the orientation of the pelvis. So when pelvic tilt increases, what does it mean? It means that pelvis rotate backward and bring back the spine in a vertical position. This is very important from a clinical point of view because when you rotate backward, people tend to think that we have a hip flexion. That's actually totally the opposite. So if I were to rotate my pelvis backward, I do that, and now I'm in hyperextension. Someone that has a hip hyperextension <coughs> is going to have some difficulty to walk because in order to walk, I need to have some reserve of extension. If I rotate the pelvis backward, now I shuffle. And sometimes you see like old people shuffling and we think that, oh, they probably have a hip problem. Maybe they have a loss of lumbar spine, a lot of this, and therefore 
the retrovert. So what do I mean by, by retrovert? Let me show you on this specific patient. So here we can see like uh, the pelvic tilt is red, so probably not, not that good. So if I were to remove the rotation of the pelvis, so this is a compensation. The patient compensate for a problem that is somewhere in the spine, and we're going to uh, try to find this problem. Now if I remove the rotation of the pelvis, look at the global orientation, and I can even drop, drop a plumb line so that we have a visual representation. So by turning the pelvic backward, so if I put back the pelvis in the orientation for this patient, by turning the pelvis backward, the patient brings back the spine in a vertical position. So it's very important to understand what is the natural position, orientation of this specific patient. So what do we know? This patient compensates at the level of the pelvis, so turn the pelvis backward to bring back the spine in a vertical position. That's the first parameter. Let's go back to our list. The second parameter that I think is quite important is the shape of the lordosis. So we don't measure the lordosis by itself because it doesn't mean anything. 40 degree can be perfect for one patient, can be a flat back for another one, and can be over correction for a third patient. The amount of lumbar lordosis really depends on the shape of the pelvis. So that's why instead of measuring the shape of the pelvis by itself and the lordosis by itself, we measure the offset between those two parameters. And basically, you want those two parameters to match, or at least to be within 10 degrees of each other. So if I look at this patient, what do we, ha what do we have? We have 20 degree offset. That means that the low dosis is short of the PI by about 20 degree. So there is a lack of lumbar dosis on this specific patient. And then you can keep going and look at the parameters. So thoracic kyphosis, you're quite familiar with it. 50 degree on this specific part patient, the SVA, 14 centimeter. So remember I told you that the SVA is supposed to fall over the sacrum. If you look at what is happening here, I'm going to remove the rotation. It's way in the front. So you want the SVA to be less than four or five centimeter. That means that to be over the sacrum or a little bit in the front. And now what you can do, you can, um, so we have to be like very, very clear. Please go ahead. symptoms or complaints and you do this measurement and you find that they are way off anatomically, what does that mean? So, so it's like you know, having, having a patient with a big disc uh, herniation, but that you find that in a, just by chance and there is no, no clinical, clinical symptom. So we don't operate on, uh, on the image. We don't treat uh, uh, the, the, the image. So if a patient has absolutely no, no, no clinical symptom, maybe <coughs> you will never see the patient. And I will say for sure it's not an indication for any form of, of, uh, of treatment. For sure, no, no surgery. Uh, maybe it will be more in terms of physical, physical therapy to make sure that the patient keep uh, having like good muscle because in order to compensate, you need some good muscle. But sagittal deformity just by itself in the absence of clinical symptom is not an indication for, for surgery. So let, let's take uh, um, just an, a, another case, maybe not a so old patient. So if we take... This is the sun, by the way, coming up before Jason takes it out of our view. It's beautiful. So, you know, it's like a cooking show. This one is, is all, already a uh, measure. So. Actually, I'm going to do the measurement very, very quickly. I just delete them. So this one is easy because we have two hip prosthesis, so we don't have to wonder where the femoral head is so probably behind the hip. So. L1, then I'm going to go to T1. So you see, it really takes like uh, uh, one or two minutes just to do to do to do the measurement. So 
So here we have, a, it's a 56 year old uh, uh, patient. You can see it here or, or in your database. So we do exactly the same type of measurement. And now we, we, we are looking at what, what, what is going on. So what is going on is that we have a global malignment. So we have a positive SVA. I can drop a SVA so that we have a visual representation. And then we can look at our, our, our parameter. So think about the SVA, like the, the, the plumb line as being the consequence of everything else. So depending on the shape of the pelvis and the orientation of the, of the, of the pelvis, the shape of the spine, sorry, and the orientation of the spine, you're going to have different, uh, different uh, uh, SVA. I have a question to you and to Kevin. Kevin, uh, Kevin Clower is our MBA and uh, business leader for the spine service. Can we export this data table directly into Epic? Yeah, so, so what you can do, uh, so from a technical point of view, that's, that's uh, something that is uh, possible. Technically, there is usually not challenge. It's just like uh, 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 more uh, epic usually doesn't work with third party uh, software. So what you can do right now, you can pull the, 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 the image from your, from your pack system. And if you want to just upload that as a, as a PDF of a JPEG, you can actually just uh, save this image with all the measurement as a, as a, um, as a JPEG and, and push that in a, in a pic, but that will be a manual, manual import. So if we, if we look at what is going on with, with, uh, with, with this patient, what do we have? We have a small loss of lumbar, lumbar dosis, so about uh, 12, 12 degrees. And despite like a, a, a thoracic aphosis on the on the larger end, and so if again if it was a surgical candidate and that is being decided based on clinical judgment, then what you can do you can simulate the, simulate your surgery. So you can decide to increase a little bit uh, the lordosis through maybe a cage. So I can draw a cage. Apply this. And you will see the change uh, on the image, and and in, in in the measurement. So you can see, well, I put a pretty big cage. I put, you know, it's a, it's a numerical simulation, so I have uh, no complication. So I'll answer that. <clears throat> I think there's no doubt that A, we have to kind of consolidate and structure our rehabilitation efforts. B, no question that, I mean, this is a breakthrough technology. I'm obviously deeply biased for many reasons. Um, we share the same godfather in Jean Dubuisset, as you probably know. Um, the, um, the thing that we have not done yet, and that the ISSG, for instance, has not done yet, that is wide open is with EOS, a low radiation system is check the alignment changes of a structured rehab program. Mm -hmm. So that is a very reasonable uh, request and obviously correlate that with human, with the patient factors is a huge deal. Oh great, you're going to the coronal plane. I was going to have you show and talk about the coronal plane also. Yep. So. Um in, ter in terms of uh, co coronal plane, what type of measurement do we have? So we have like the, the classic, let me go back to something. So the classic um, core bangle. Uh, we have like the classic uh, coronal plumb line. 
We also have some, some measurements that are specific to, um, to uh, the pediatric or the infantile deformity, like the rib verte vertebral uh, angle, uh, ac uh, rib vertebral angle difference that has been uh, shown to correlate with the risk of, uh, of, uh, of progression. So all the classic parameters that you have, uh, that we all know about, are, are part of the, of the software. There is a few other parameters that, uh, that we have will be like a measurement of a spondy. So you will have like the grade of the spondy and the focal, focal kyphosis. You can also measure um, a surface area. Uh, let me see, it will be, will be like a st uh, stenosis. So if you can measure the size of the spinal cord or the size of a, even like a, a muscular area, uh, you can just use a, the stenosis tool. And then you can simulate your, your, your surgery. So you can simulate the surgery either using cages, using uh, osteotomy. So it doesn't have to be big osteo osteotomy. It can be just facet resection. You can simulate some uh, instrumentation like uh, a, a custom rod. And I think what is uh, even more, more interesting, you know, uh, that's one thing to measure and simulate, but may maybe what is even more important is that you can actually share that. So you can create a case, share all this information, so I can show you like in my, in my, in my database, if I go in, in, my, in my case. So this is some, um, some, some case that I actually have some, some collaborators. That means that if I have a collaborator, I will have access to the image, to the measurement, to the surgical planning. And this can be uh, seen either in the software, on the app, or uh, online. This is a great Scott. Is there any way Uh, of the of the patient or of the physician? <laughs> <laughs> so so there, there there is there is a module where you can track clinical track clinical uh, outcome. We kind of give up on that because that's the thing that everybody is talking about, but nobody does to uh, to really be uh, uh, um, uh, um, someone is chatting with me to really uh, follow up the patient from a clinical point of view. But yes, I mean, I know that was probably a joke, but, but uh, uh, the, the alignment is only a small component of the patient evaluation. You know, I'm not here to tell you that the alignment is going to be the answer to everything. No, not at all. You know, that's a small part, but that you need to take into account when you decide to fuse, because when you decide to fuse a patient, basically you're uh, fixing the alignment of a small, medium, or la large region, and you need to understand what is going on above and below. Yes, so, so we have, um, uh, we, we, we looked at the alignment of the, of the patient versus the risk of, uh, of junctional issue from a PGK point of view. And that's where we realized that uh, the age adjusted alignment threshold are, are key because what used to be considered like for a 60 or 65 year old being like well aligned, actually now, now we are going a little bit uh, backward and like, no, what is, it's actually over correction. So now if I, if I go back like, to, 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 the, to this slide where, where, where we have like the, the age adjusted align, alignment threshold, we realize that very often it's a problem due to the overcorrection. And the way we see PJK, we see PJK, at least one part of the PJK, as being a compulsory mechanism. So if you overcorrect the patient and it's fused from ear to ear, the only way for the patient to compensate is to use what is above the instrumentation. So if it's over 10 level, we are usually pretty happy and we talk about reciprocal thoracic kyphosis and a nice curvature. If it's over two, three level, we call that a PJK. So we think uh, of PJK as being a way for the patient to compensate, to go back to an alignment that fits uh, their age. So, so that's been documented? Yes. So is your document? To, uh, yes, to undercorrect based on the classic, uh, classic uh, 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 alignment threshold, or to follow the, the, those guidelines. If you look at this, this guideline, just looking at the, at the SVA, so we recommend that for an older patient to have a SVA of five, six centimeter versus for a young adult to have a SVA of zero or, neg or, or negative. So. It depends on the severity of the under correction. Or 
Yeah, so the T1 pelvic angle is a measurement of the global deformity. So it doesn't, uh, uh, independently of the amount of compensation. So I like to dissociate the measurement of the deformity. I don't, sorry, I'm, I don't understand the question for disability. Disability. Yes, pelvic tilt correlate with disability, but what is even uh, more interesting is that I think the correlation between pelvic tilt and disability is just because having a retroversion is a normal response to a sagittal deformity. So what correlates with disability is more the deformity than the compensation. We also learned that a patient that is unable to compensate through the pelvic tilt actually have worse disability. So it's a it's a complex complex answer, but the the, the inability to compensate lead to is associated to worse disability than if a patient is able to compensate uh, normally. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right, but you know we, we can flip this, this around and look at like uh, uh, during years and years, even even in the adult population, we were doing surgery because of a cob angle, and, and there is absolutely no 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 reason to do that. You know, unless you have a progression, unless you have a rotatory subluxation with maybe some impingement on the on, on the nerve, it's just a, a bad a bad X-ray. Uh, we, we now prove that the core angle does not relate to disability in the adult. There is absolutely no reason, except maybe for co cosmetic reason. So again, to go, to go uh, uh, in line with your comment, this is not, not an indication, but at least there is some parameter around. We took like hundreds of parameters, and that's the one that correlates the most. So it doesn't mean that you need to operate, but it means that those are the most important. Maybe not like the number one parameter when you take like the full uh, different aspect of the patient, but uh, we all rely on image. You know, look, look at like, all the cases that you presented today. We had like two lines on, on, on clinical presentation, like, oh, the patient maybe, maybe had an accident and had a little bit of radiculopathy, and all the rest was, was imaging. So if you're at the point where you have a full evaluation of the patient with a psychological aspect, with some sleep deprivation uh, t testing, everything that you have in mind, I will be totally in line. So I think like your point is an important one, but we're not there yet. So based on what we know, uh, those parameters seem to be uh, uh, of key importance. Dave, we need the brain map, obviously, and this will possibly yeah. come. Yeah, we need the brain map. Mm -hmm. I think this is, you know, oh, yeah, absolutely. Your. I think the more information you have, the more knowledge you have. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of, you know, with this and some of the other technologies. This is, you know, something that's going on. Before we conclude. Mm -hmm. So let's, before we conclude here, because it's 8 o'clock, I want to ask Kevin where we are with surgeon map implementation uh, now, 
and uh, so October and uh, where we'll go in the near future, maybe Virginie then can conclude by offering guidance. Sure. Um, so we've been working on getting Surgimap here at SNI for about six to seven months. It's been a really long process. We're a big system. We have a lot of hoops to jump through. Um, but just this last week, we finally got Surgimap downloaded on one of our computers, and we're getting access for some of our docs and our complex spine fellows. Um, so now that we have access and logins for them, we'll be able to start using it, um, getting some feedback. And our goal, we're currently transitioning from uh, vetting Surgimap um, to be able to use it to implementation. Um, so at that point, we'll move Surgimap onto a Citrix server so we can access it anywhere if you have a Citrix mm -hmm. login. Um, and getting more servers as needed as we see um, usage go up. Uh, but hopefully we're going to be able to use this as kind of a pilot for all of Providence and make this more widely available um, to others if we can uh, see how we can use it and then also looking at solutions to get some of this information into Epic and into the patient record so we can view it in one location. Great, thank you. So Virginie, that was an excellent lecture. Uh, love for you to give us some additional guidance. I think we saw the complexity of the spine, I think this software, I don't know whether you concur, Brennan, is a breakthrough in terms of putting it all together and making it pretty user-friendly. Uh, obviously, having EOS here would be a great uh, help, and we're working on it, right? Uh, we're not giving up any foods for thought in terms of uh, what is it meant in clinical practice, what are your experiences as multiple sites are trying to get online with uh, Surgeon Map. Maybe also talk about the business model, which is pretty unique with, by the way, thank you, Depew Synthes, for your sponsorship today. Um, how does this business model work? Yes, yeah, so, so the business model is that um, Surgimap is free for the for the user, so for for the clinician, for 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 the researcher. So you can go online and, and download it. But we have a, a numerous partner, so we are, have some relationship with most of the of the big player in the industry. So uh, the Pew, of course. I know Medtronic, Nuvasiv, K2M, and basically we implement some of their uh, implant in the software. So you can simulate a, a Depew cage in the in the software. You can order some some specific implant, and the industry is paying so that we can have some employee that develops the software. But from the end user point of view, this is um, this is free. Uh, um, and, and then, you know, it's like, it's like everything in life. You have to give it a try, you know. If you just watch someone using the software or watch someone do the sagittal alignment, you're like, seems pretty easy. And then when you try, you're totally lost. Uh, so just give it a try. Uh, invest like 10 minutes uh, in it and then contact us. And, and Steve will be more than happy like to, to, to do a, a WebEx training session to, to, to help you to get, uh, to get started. And then it should be part of uh, uh, of the standard evaluation. Like, and it can be with Surgery Map, or it can be with with something else. You know, we have to to be like uh, uh, honest about it. But when you have a, um, a scoliosis, everybody is going to measure a core angle. We should uh, push to, so that when you have a sagittal sagittal film, you measure your pelvic parameter and the lumbar dosis. That's part of. That's not enough just to to guesstimate what what you see on the on the on the screen. And if you surge him up, great. If you use something else, you know that's not uh, the most uh, the most important. I would say. Brian, do you see this uh, becoming part of our radiologists' uh, routine armamentarium? Uh, it's certainly be useful. Uh, yeah, no, it'll certainly be useful. Um, I don't know how many people actually go through and how many of these angles are ever calculated and put in the report. Um, and I'm not sure which ones are the most useful for you and which ones aren't. But I mean, this basically does it automatically, uh, which you know gets rid of a lot of the air and uh, makes it more repeatable. Great. So, any final questions for Virginie? Yeah, Tarush, use yeah. the microphone. Yeah, so we did all the validation was done on on uh, adult patient because that's what we, we 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 mainly use. So of course, you know, if you don't see any any landmark, you cannot do any any measurement. You know, the software is not a, a ma magic magic solution. Um, the, the only thing is that if you don't see like the femoral the sacral and plate, that's not necessarily a big deal. That's not necessarily a big deal because the PILL, so the lumbar dosis versus the, the pelvic incidence. 
you take the cycle and play it twice. So that means that it disappears in the in the in the calculation, and the, re the rest of the param par parameter uh, um, are pretty uh, straight uh, straightforward. But if you don't see the landmark, you cannot measure. That's unfortunately we we are not able like to solve uh, the lack of information. Any other questions? Always oh, thank you so much, Virginie.